Hi, everyone. Um, I, I'll introduce our, our, our speaker for today. So first, welcome to the um, CS seminar series for uh, fall 2021. Um, very excited that some of our talks uh, are going to be uh, in person. This talk is virtual. Uh, we have uh, Uri Shalit joining us from, uh, from Israel. So Uri is a senior lecturer, uh, but that's just what they call assistant professors over there at the Technion uh, Israel Institute of Technology. Um, he's working in statistics and information systems at the uh, uh, industrial engineering and management department. Uh, his research focuses mainly on um, machine learning for healthcare and the intersection of machine learning as, and causal inference, and particularly how causal inference uh, uh, can be applied to uh, robust learning, transfer learning, and interpretability. And uh, with that, let's all welcome Uri. Hi, everyone. Hi, Roy. Thank you very much for inviting me. So am I the first speaker in the series? Yes, yeah. Wow, what an honor. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I wish I could come in person. That would have been nice. But next time, definitely. Next time, hopefully. Uh, great. So I'll talk about causality inspired machine learning. Um, I guess the crowd is diverse in terms of uh, background. Uh, Feel free to write questions in the chat. I'll stop from time to time and try to check them out. Uh, and also you could just, just ask me uh, whenever I don't mind. Uh, and just to make sure, how much time do I have, Roy? Uh, we have about an hour, including questions. Oh, great. Uh, OK, so let's start. Um, so as everyone here probably knows, machine learning has seen some remarkable successes uh, over the last uh, several years on image classification, including uh, medical imaging, uh, some amazing results, uh, work with text, work with audio. It's all uh, very excited and what got, I imagine, many of us into the field uh, in the first place. Uh, however, uh, you know, once, once, people, once we've succeeded as a field in solving some task, kind of, the boundaries pushed forward and we're seeing maybe the drawbacks of the current methods. So this is the easy cows example. Uh, I have a question. Can, can you have just with a show of hands if anyone has seen the easy cows example? Easy cows versus hard cows, difficult cows? Okay, see not many people have seen it. Okay, uh, so this is from a talk by Pietro Perona and this is a cow, obviously. Uh, and what, what they did is they took uh, uh, image uh, recognition API, one of the state-of-the-art uh, things you could get on the internet, uh, and gave it this image. And it very obviously recognized that this is a cow, like uh, right, 0.992, it's uh, very, uh, very confident about it. Uh, but then they showed this cow to the same uh, image recognition API, and it failed miserably. Like it did not recognize that this is a cow. It recognized there's a beach and a, a ocean, but not a cow, even though it's pretty obvious it's a cow um, to, to any of us. And even though it succeeded on this cow, which, which looks kind of similar, right? It's like, it's not even a different color of a cow. Uh, and the reason is probably because um, the, the image, you know, all these deep networks that they use to, to recognize these images were, were trained on data sets where cows don't usually sit on beaches. Maybe they don't have, didn't have images from India, had images uh, maybe for cows, uh, you know, from Switzerland or from the US or wherever. And so seeing a cow on the beach completely threw it off. And there are many more such examples. This is not some outlier. Uh, so this is a case where the test set is, is different from the train set. But we know it's not like arbitrarily hard, right? Humans succeed easily on this task. So there are many other such cases where the test set is not the same. The test solution is not the same as the train, but it's the difference is in ways that at least as humans, we don't expect a, a, a learning algorithm to fail, but it, it still often fails. So for example, these are examples from a benchmark called WILD, where the train set is, let's say, satellite images for certain areas and years, and the test set is similar satellite images, but from different times or different uh, places. 
And on the bottom, it's pathology slides from different hospitals. And again, the test hospitals are different from the trained hospitals. So these are all examples of uh, uh, transfer learning or demand adaptation problems where we would like our learning algorithms to succeed. And we expect that it's possible. It seems plausible that we could make it succeed, but the current methods often do not. Okay, so again, test is not the same as training. And this is not some edge case because first, the future is usually different from the past. So if you work with any data from the past and you expect to apply your, your uh, uh, model to data from the future, your future might be different and the solutions might shift. Uh, often in machine learning, we use training sets that were curated from some specific setting, right? It's not always easy to get a label training set, but the task of setting up a training set in itself induces some biases in our training set that might not be reflected in the test. And the challenge is how do we formalize what shifts from train to test can we expect to overcome? Because obviously if the test distribution is completely unimaginably different from the training set, we cannot expect anything to succeed. So how can we formalize what's a plausible uh, shift? And how do we create algorithms that would succeed under what we deem to be plausible shifts? And I'll talk about some, some thoughts about this uh, in this talk. And so how to proactively learn models which are robust to an a priori unknown change in the test distribution. Okay, so we know the test will change. We know it will change, not completely, but change in ways that we cannot completely foresee, not entirely foresee. How do we proactively learn a model that will succeed uh, uh, against it, that will be uh, robust against this change? And I will talk about, uh, my talk will have two parts, which correspond to two papers. Uh, the first is about unsupervised covariate shift, uh, which was published last year in ICML with Daniel Greenfield. And the second is about unsupervised domain shift, uh, where we talk about the relation between calibration and as domain generalization. This work with Joao Wald and Amir Feder and Daniel Greenfield, which was just accepted here in Nurex uh, last week. So we'll start with the first. So robust learning with the Hilbert Schmidt independence criteria. Okay. So we want to learn models which are robust to a priori unknown changes in the test distribution. So specifically, the way you formalize it is we have uh, some source distribution, which we denote TS, uh, XY as for source, and X are the features and Y are the labels. And we want to learn a model that works well on some unknown target distribution, P prime of XY, which is a member of some set Q. Okay, so it's not arbitrary, it's some, some set Q, and we'll, we'll uh, explain what Q is uh, a bit later. Uh, but one thing we already assume for this first half of the talk about Q is the assumption known as covariate shift. So we assume that the conditional distribution for all distributions in Q, the conditional of Y given X is the same as in our source distribution PS. Okay, so the conditional of Y given X does not change. The only thing that might change is P of X. Okay? Now, and we'll restrict you a bit more soon. So this assumption that we have covariate shifts, so only distribution over the covariates or features changes, it means that this task is easy if learning the conditional ACs, right? If you get P of Y given X like perfectly or almost perfectly on our source distribution, whatever the target is, as long as P of Y given X is the same, we're good. So we will focus on cases where learning P of Y given X is not easy, where a model might be misspecified or maybe you don't have a lot of training data. So this in itself is challenging, and then you still have to contend with the fact that P of X might change. So uh, any questions so far about this? You can also write in the chat. Um, oh yeah, Xiaobin Lin. Uh, Or is that something else? Oh, who knows? I'll, I'll keep going. Um, okay, uh, I'll skip this. And specifically, uh, what we propose to address this uh, problem of, of uh, learning against a priori unknown covariate shifts is learning with the independence criteria. And here is where causal ideas come in. So, my talk title is Causality Inspired Machine Learning. And indeed, this is inspired by by causal, by working the work of, in the world of causal inference. It's not uh, like uh, concretely causal, it's inspired. So what happens if X causes Y? We can 
sometimes write y in the following way. y is equal to f star x plus epsilon. So f star x, we can think about as a causal mechanism taking x and turning it into y. And epsilon is some noise. And we assume that epsilon is independent of x, right? That's what makes it noise. And f star, like I said, is the mechanism. And if we just look at this equation and just move things around, we get the following. We get that y minus f star is independent of x, right? This is just epsilon is y minus f star of x, right? And just looking at this, uh, Mui et al. proposed in 2009 that you could use this, in, this like simple insight that the residual between the uh, true model and the label should be independent of x to learn causal models. Uh, so to learn, let's say, the structure of a causal graph. Uh, but to do that, they needed a non-parametric measure of independence. They needed to somehow look at the independence between x and this residual and to, to have a method that does not depend on some specific parametric uh, specification of, of these distributions, because we do not know these uh, uh, specifications usually. And what they uh, use is something called the Hilbert-Schmidt independence criterion, or HSIC. And HSIC is actually quite cool, and this is, and, and we'll go into it now uh, for a bit, and I think it, it's of independent interest uh, uh, beyond the way we used it. Uh, so what's H6? So if we have X and Y uh, are two metric spaces and we have a distribution over them P of X, Y, I'm abusing notation a bit here. And we have GX and GY are reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces on X and Y, and they have their kernels K and L respectively. So this is standard RKHS theory on X and Y. Uh, H6 is something, is a statistic that measures the degree of dependence between the random variables X and Y. And what's nice about HSIC is that it's zero if and only if x, x is independent of y. So this is if, for nice enough, like for, for not too crazy uh, probability spaces. So this is kind of co like a, a covariance, but turbocharged because it's if and only, if, right? Covariance is if uh, something is independent, the covariance is zero, but not the other way around. For HSIC, it goes both ways. So HSIC is really a powerful way uh, to measure dependence or independence of two random variables. And it has an empirical version, uh, which I'll show now. So if we have a sample of pairs, x1, y1 to xn, yn, they could be vectors or scalars, whatever. And we'll have k and l as the uh, respective uh, kernel matrices on x and y separately. So they're both n by n kernel matrices. The empirical version of HSIC is just the following. It's one over n minus one squared, that's just a normalization, it times the trace of the matrix KCLC. So K is the kernel matrix on X, L is the kernel matrix on Y, C is just a centering matrix. Okay, so this is just simple, this is easy to calculate, it's differentiable, uh, and, and so on. And what uh, Gretton and all in 2005 showed that the empirical estimate converges nicely to, to the population version, so this is actually something you can use in practice, and many people have used it for many things, uh, mostly for independence things, uh, obviously. So how can we use this to learn something, like as a learning uh, um, uh, idea? So assume we have this, uh, an hypothesis class H of functions, let's say neural nets of certain depth. The classic way to learn is you minimize some loss function. So you minimize over the hypothesis uh, class, the expectation of some loss of y and your prediction h of x, where h is some member of the hypothesis class, right? This is just classic ERM. Uh, when you learn with HSIC, what Mui et al. proposed in 2009, and again, they propose it to learn as a means to learn the causal graph, is the following. You minimize the HSIC, this dependence measure between x and the residual y minus h of x. Okay? And these are just the RKHS, the, the kernel spaces which you use. So now you have this dependence measure between your features or your, your samples and the residuals. And you want something, a model H, that it creates residuals which are as independent as possible from the input. And if for some H star, this objective is actually zero, zero so if, if we manage to minimize it, this means that Y minus H star of X is independent of X. And recall that for the true mechanism, y minus f star of x is independent of x. And it's not hard to show that if you indeed achieve zero here, 
then the your minimizer h star is the same as the true mechanism up to a constant. So you're you might be off by constant, but nothing more. Okay. So this means that learning with this H6 criterion makes sense, at least in, in the sense that if you actually minimize it, you get the right function up to some uh, additive shift. And what we further show, and I will go into it, is that for many in many cases, it, the ASIC objective also is equivalent to making the gradient independent, the gradient of the loss independent of the input. So like the input, your x's have no more information about where you should go if you're doing gradient optimization. That's another sense in which it, it seems like a plausible way to learn. And this is actually, it generalizes the way, it, if you do OLS, like ordinary least squares, the residuals are orthogonal to the instances. So this is a generalization. So instead of orthogonal, you have actually this H6, so you have a true independence if you manage to minimize. So it, you, you can think of what we're proposing as a kind of strong generalization of ordinary least squares. Um, I'll skip this, even though it's related to the information bottleneck, which I think we have somewhere. Uh, so is this, okay, can we actually learn with this? So we showed that if we minimize it to zero, it makes sense, but is this a learnable objective that's generalized? So first we show, it's, it's quite straightforward to show, you can optimize this with stochastic gradient descent using mini batches to approximate H6. So it, it plays nicely with modern frameworks. And we also show in our paper that minimizing over a sample, even though this, this is like this, a weird objective function that ties together all of your training set because you have this kernel matrix that takes everything in at once. It doesn't decompose. It, it still works. So we, we show that learn, minimizing over a sample leads to generalization under some technical conditions about the, the kernel expectations and, and the way the kernel you use on the residual. If you use RBF kernels, for example, it's fine. And the proof, I won't go into the details, but basically we can reduce this to a weighted learning pro pro problem over X cross X, so over a Cartesian product, it product of X with itself. And, and then kind of we can make a reduction to standard learning theory, theory using a rather macro complexity. Okay, so if the hypothesis class has bounded complexity, it, everything works well. So we show this works as a, as a learning objective, but does it work? for what we wanted to do. Like, does it actually help us protect ourselves against these covariages? So what we prove is that it does in the sense that I'll, and it's, we have several senses, I'll explain one of them. So I'll now define the set of target distribution. So we said, here's the set of distributions I think my test set might come from. I don't know what it, what will it be exactly, but I know it will come from the set Q. So what is Q? The Q is the set of, uh, distributions uh, uh, p prime that have the following uh, uh, property. Uh, they're absolutely continuous with respect to my source uh, distribution. So there's no kind of instances which have zero probability of appearing in my source. And the density ratios can be between p prime and my source distribution ps can be expressed as functions within the reproducing kernel Hilbert space gx that I'm using. So it's not any density ratio, it's a density ratio, which is nice enough to be inside an RKHS. And we can control the size of Q by the norm of uh, the, the RKHS we are using. So again, we're now allowing P of X to change, not arbitrarily, but in these, like under these two constraints. Okay, so, and then now we're going to show something that like kind of uh, guarantee that we have if our target distribution comes from this Q if you're learning with the eight. So if indeed Y has some F star X plus epsilon uh, uh, structure, uh, then for any hypothesis, H of X, we have the following. The supermove of the mean squared error under, uh, of H under any P prime in the set Q that we defined above is bounded by two times MX, MY, these constants, times the eight plus a bias term, plus some irreducible noise. So this means that if we're minimizing H6 and minimizing this bias, which is easy, this is bias over the, the source domain, so we can calculate this. 
we're minimizing an upper bound over the worst case mean squared error in the set Q of potential target distributions. So the, in this sense, learning with HSIC is, is robust against changes in the distribution of X. And just to explain the constants, MY is the maximum norm of functions in, in GY. And the larger MY, the looser the bound, but the better we can approximate this target, the residuals between uh, the Ys and F star. And MX, this constant, controls the size of the target set Q. And again, so uh, smaller MX means the bound is, is tighter, but uh, the target set is smaller. So that's a trade-off we have to make. And ASIC, just to be clear, is evaluated on the source distribution. So minimizing ASIC on the source uh, kind of spreads the losses in a bit of a different way than the way ordinary, uh, let's say, uh, mean squared error would. So we, we give uh, even smaller subsets, we give them somehow more weight, we're more conservative, and that uh, helps protect against these changes. Um, Okay, so I'll go into the experiments in a moment. Uh, any questions about the basic idea and, and this uh, theorem? So for um, questions, let's do this. So uh, please please raise your hand. If you can't unmute yourselves, uh, we can do that. Or you can just write your questions on the chat. If you are unmuted, just uh, ask your question. Okay, um, it's not immediately intuitive to me why increasing or a greater value for M sub Y would uh, give us a better way of um, calculating the H sick that you were talking about. You said the greater uh, M sub Y um, increases, makes a looser bound, but also results in, yeah, a better approximation of the target. Why is that the case? Um, because we are not actually guaranteed that this target is within the kernel space. Uh, GY, we, we don't know the form of this function a priori, and it might not be within the kernel space that we're optimizing over. Now, I'm, I'm not actually sure what would happen in practice in this case, but at least in theory, it, it might be a problem. There's another question on the chat. Um, so during the optimization process, uh, why do we need to, pr to prove the error um, in feature X, that, um, that the error and the feature X are independent? So we don't have to, but I mean, the optimization process makes the model, helps learn the model such the residuals are more or less dependent on X. Okay, so we're, we're reducing dependence between the input features and the residuals. And it turns out that's a good thing. Uh, it's not a priori obvious. That's part of our theory and our experiments show that, that that is actually something that you might want to do. I'm, I hope that answers the question. And uh, oh, I see there are more questions here. Uh, why do you need to prove the error? So like I said, we, we don't have to prove it, but it, it turns out it helps. If you do this, you could bound uh, this uh, worst case error. And maybe a more intuitive reason would be it makes the gradients independent of, uh, of the input. So you have kind of nowhere to go. Um, I see, I'll, I'll take one more question. Uh, so we are not assuming we know the type of perturbations the test set will have. That's exactly the challenge. We do assume they're bounded in the sense of uh, this Q. We assume they're not like completely uh, crazy, but we don't know what they will be. And that's why this is a challenging problem. Um, and learning is on historic data. And I'll take the last question maybe once I'm done. I found Samuel, sorry. Uh, 
Okay, so I just, I want to go quickly through one of our experimental results. Uh, this is using a benchmark introduced by Alex Lidal uh, at NERC 20, uh, 2019. Uh, cells out of sample data set. So they had these 64, 64 images of mouse cells stained with one of several possible uh, proteins. And the test is to label the type of protein. And they had this kind of an increasing uh, difficulty. So they had the source and target one was just ordinary held out data. Target two, they had different plates. Uh, and different wells, the way the place they put the, the uh, uh, how do you call it, the, the, the cells uh, were different from the source. Uh, then they kind of took uh, different days and then a different day and different micro microscope. So it's progressively harder and more different the target from the source. Note that this is not necessarily covariate shift. It might be a, it should, it, it might be a bit more, we're, we're, but it's mostly changes in the X's and not in y given x because they know what's the true y. And what they showed, they had this some deep uh, learning architecture, which I won't go into, which performed best. And what we did was simple. Was simple. We took the, the same architecture, architecture that performed best and just switched the loss. So we took the ordinary cross entropy loss and switched it with ASIC loss uh, with kernel width one, just so it's, it's very simple and we have code for the AC class. It's very easy to optimize with. And they also had this uh, test time augmentation uh, where the prediction was average over five crops taken from the corner and center image. And we also tried that because that really improved performance in their paper. And what we see, so we're showing class balanced error. Oh, there were seven classes, but there weren't variants. And rem remember target one is ordinary test set and two, three, four are kind of shifted more and more with, with, with respect to the source distribution. So this is just the baseline texture features and one of this regression. And once we use this deep lock uh, architecture with ASIC versus cross entropy, we, we see that across all the target sets, the error is lower. Even on the ordinary targets, even when like it's just ordinary machine learning, it still works better. And when we add the test uh, time augmentation, we actually barely see any improvement uh, for ASIC, but it's still better for than the cross entropy uh, case. And let me just say, we did not heavily optimize anything. We took the architecture as is, kernel width one, like it, it, it worked pretty well out of the box. And we, we saw that on several other things. So this works surprisingly well, even in cases in just ordinary test sets. So we, we tried it on MNIST and so on. And it, it's just, it, it seems to have something good going for it, which I do not claim is completely explained by our theory. It, it might be some other things as well, uh, but we also tried linear models and so on. And this H6 loss uh, uh, works very nicely. Um, okay, so that's like, uh, this, that's the, the experimental part. And now I want to move on to our second uh, uh, project uh, about uh, called on calibration and out of domain generalization. So this is just accepted to NURBS. And if in the previous part of the talk, we, we only looked at covariate shifts, so we only allowed P of X to change and P of Y given X versus the same. Now we are allowing both to change, but in a, in a certain way, not arbitrary. So again, we have the source distribution. And again, we will have an a priori unknown target distribution, P prime of XY. So again, we're not assuming we know how it will change, but we, are, uh, we will uh, not allow it to change arbitrarily. We will structure, we will only allow a certain type of change. And the way we define what changes are, are uh, allowed is uh, through the language of causal graph. And what we show is that something called robust calibration uh, is, is a way to go for these kinds of changes. So th this will talk will relate to things which do not seem related uh, on the face of it, which is uh, calibration and out of distribution generalization. So I'll just briefly go over calibration. So let's say, uh, we'll see a classifier is calibrated. Let's say for this subset of patients, our classifier says, 
have 0.9 chance of having a tumor. So we will say this class for is calibrated if indeed 90% of the patient who had a prediction 0.9 have a tumor. So if the uh, predicted probabilities match uh, the reality for every, uh, for every given probability. So that's a, a, a calibrated classifier. Uh, and what we will go over is, is to the realm of multiple domains. So let's say we have data from two different hospitals. We will look at calibration separately at the two hospitals. Okay. Uh, so now we have in both hospitals, we have the sets of patients for which our classifier F gives an 0.9 chance of having a tumor. But what happens if actually when we go to the data, we see that one hospital 100% of the, of the subset predicted as 0.9 have a, a tumor, and in the other hospital, it's only 0.8. Okay, so we have miscalibration, and it's not the same miscalibration in the two hospitals. It, this might be a sign of model instability. So if we aspire for a model to generalize to a third unknown hospital, this might give us a kind of uh, cause for worry. It might mean that the classifier is, is uh, relying on some spurious feature of the hospitals that might not generalize between hospitals. Uh, this is just a clue, but we'll formalize this soon. Now, on the other hand, if the true probabilities match uh, what the classifier is saying, this is an encouraging sign of, of stability. And of course, it doesn't guarantee anything, but it's, it's encouraging. So, so we'll talk about stability across environments. So what's in it? Well, I'll call this sometimes environment, sometimes domain. Uh, and an environment is a setting such as a hospital or a country or a year for which the data is gathered that might affect the distribution of features and the labels in a way that we wish to be robust. In. So I work a lot in healthcare. We gather data from hospitals. We want to be robust against the specific identity of the hospital we gather the data from. But every hospital is different in terms of population and practice and many other things. So it's not trivial. And as we all know, machine learning often kind of takes in all the information, including spurious information that we might not want to use. So the goal is to have stable quality of predictions across environments. And just to formalize this, we'll have random variables, E, X, and Y, E for environment, X for features, Y for labels with their respective sample spaces. And we'll, we'll look at binary labels most of the time. And we assume we have training data from a su set of environments, E train, which is a subset of the like, entire set of possible environments. So we have some fine, finite set of environments that we use. And we learn a predictor from X to Y. And what we claim is that a good pro property for stability is the following conditional independence. Note, this is different from the one we've seen earlier. This is Y is independent of E conditioned on F of X. So when we condition on our predictor, it, the label is no longer uh, dependent on the environment. Okay, so we have this kind of separation. We, we, this is, we're not saying this is necessarily a good predictor, but it's a stable predictor okay, because it means that we kind of it cut off all the possible links between the environments and the label. So we claim this is a good property. We will go into what, what this means uh, soon. But note, just from an optimization point of view, this is difficult because we're now conditioning on our model output. And even if the labels are binary, f of, f of x is, is not in general binary. So we're conditioning on some continuous variable. So this is a, a bit uh, difficult. And now we'll get into the causal graph perspective of how we define this problem and what kind of environments and, and uh, test distributions are we allowing. Um, the, so it does not mean that the predictor will correctly make prediction no matter in what environment, though of course we want that. It means that it's stable across environments. So it makes kind of the same mistakes at least. Uh, you know what to expect. Uh, or the performance in the train environments predicts performance in the test environments, even if they're different, right? I want my mistake to be the same. Uh, that's the very least, not to be kind of surprised, not to think I have a great predictor and end up ends up being a very bad predictor. Um, okay, so here's how we formalize this. Uh, so we assume we have the environment E and it uh, generates the causal features, uh, which in turn generate uh, the label. And then from the label we have two types of features. We have 
both are anti-causal. Okay, AC for anti-causal. One is spurious because it depends on the environment, and one is non-spurious. So here's, where, here's an example. Let's say E is the hospital, Y is the tumor label, X causal is patient demographics, right? The patient demogra demographics obviously can determine uh, 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 the, the odds of having a tumor, and they vary between hospitals. And now assume we have some imaging, and the imaging is anti-causal, right? It's because the, the patient has a tumor or does not have a tumor, that causes the pixels in, in the uh, MRI image. Uh, but these pixels also could be uh, dependent on the hospital, on the imaging machine, or whether the radiologist writes something on the, on the slide or do not, which is something that we've seen happen of machine learning, just picking up on what radiologists kind of mark on, on the, the slide and so on. So we have, so the pixels, some of them are spurious or some of the features of the image are, are spurious and some are non-spurious. And we would like to use the non-spurious ones, but like to discard the, the spurious ones uh, because they might not be stable across environments, right? Once env the environment changes, uh, I might get different spurious features and my classifier might be uh, misled by them. Okay, so this is how we formalize this problem. And we assume in the at test time, we get a new environment that we haven't seen, but it still obeys this graph. And most importantly, there's no error from E to Y. So the environment does not directly determine Y. Because if it does, and we have a new environment, all bits are off, right? My, all the labels might be flipped and we have we have nothing to say. So this is an important assumption made in this graph, no direct arrows from E to Y, or another way to put it that all the ways in which E affects Y are captured by the causal features which we observe, which we measure. Yeah, so at this time we have a new environment. Okay, and now we will say that a representation phi of x has no spurious correlations if y is independent of e conditioned on phi of x. So earlier I was talking about f of x, but now just a general representation. So we have phi, it takes in all the x's, uh, but it has no spurious correlations if y is independent of e conditioned on phi of x. Okay, so we generate this phi, right? We learn phi. And note that if indeed y is independent of e conditioned on phi of x, this graph as a graphical model becomes unfaithful because we now have a collider path uh, uh, for, of E and uh, Y to phi. And that means that this path cannot actually exist if this independent, conditional independence is true. Okay, this is just from graphical model uh, theory. Uh, so this means that one of these three arrows cannot exist. And if we're lucky, so sorry, this means that if we have this uh, uh, representation with no spurious uh, 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 correlations as we define here, one of these three errors does not exist. So if these two, we have no control over. If they do not, do not exist, that means that the problem is, is a nice problem. It's a problem with no actual spurious correlations. Uh, but if they do exist, uh, that means that we, some, and we still have this uh, independence means that we remove this error. Okay, uh, that means that, uh, our representation does not rely on the spurious features. So again, this is not a proof. We have a proof, but the, this kind of is a, a, a way, hand wavy proof of why having an independent, like this conditional independence means that you're not using the spurious features. And this has the same spirit as the, uh, earlier work on invariant causal prediction from Jonas Peters and variant risk minimization from uh, Arnkowski et al. So we will not think about general representations. We will focus on f of x. So we will think, we'll say our representation is actually the prediction, just the probability between zero and one uh, of, of uh, the label. And we will enforce conditional independence, this, this conditional independence. Uh, and we will call these classifiers invariant classifiers, classifiers that obey this conditional dependence. They do not use the spurious features and they are invariant changes uh, in E because of this conditional dependence. Okay, so this is just uh, writing this uh, formally. How do we define an invariant classifier for binary Y? It means that the expectation of Y condition on F of X and E is the same as 
uh, across all uh, environments. So it's independent of, of E uh, across the training event. Okay? So it's just a simple definition of conditional independence. And now, uh, the, so I see the question about the 5x is just any representation the same way that, that neural net learns, but we will focus on f of x, so just a classifier. So you, we think of it as just the probability of the link, okay? Just any class. Um, okay, so this is, we have this. This is conditional dependence and relates to this kind of causal graph we had above. Now, kind of for something completely different, calibration, okay? So this, is, and we'll soon tie these two notions together. And so as we said, calibration asserts that the predicted probability equals the true probability of an event. It's a well uh, calibrated uh, predictor. And this is uh, the definition of uh, uh, being calibrated on a single distribution. It means that the expectation of Y condition on F of X equals alpha is alpha. Okay, this is the classic definition of calibration, like a textbook definition. So if you predict there's 30% of rain tomorrow, in 30% of the cases where you predict that, there will actually be rain tomorrow. And we now extend this to calibration on all training environments, just saying a classifier is, is, multi, is calibrated on multiple environments if it's just calibrated on each and every environment separately. Okay, just straightforward. We, but we, we will need this. Okay. okay, so how are these two tied together? So it turns out it's, it's actually pretty close. If we have a binary classifier that is environment, invariant with respect to a set of training environments, then there exists some other function g from r to 0, 1, such that g composed with f is calibrated. So you can take any environment, invariant classifier and turn it into a well-calibrated classifier on all environments. And moreover, the MSC of, of this uh, new uh, kind of recalibrated classifier, it does not exceed that of x. And so you can always take a, a, something that is, is invariant and turn it into something that is class, uh, calibrated on each and every environment separately. And vice versa, if you have a classifier that is, that is calibrated in all training environments, it's almost immediate that it is actually invariant with respect to each training. Okay, so calibration it leads to invariance, and invariance can very easily be turned into calibration with no loss space. Okay. And I will go to the proof of this lemma, but it's the it's an easy proof. It's it's not hard to show this. And but this gives us something interesting because invariance was why is I'll just remind you what was invariance. Y is independent of E condition on F of X, which is a nasty optimization problem and a nasty even notion to test. Calibration is something that there's kind of uh, 40 years of literature about. Calibration is something statisticians have been looking at forever. And now we're saying these two are basically equivalent. So we can use calibration to get at invariance. Uh, so this is similar to work from IRM on invariant representations, but we have several differences. Uh, calibration is not with respect to some specific loss function. It's just an independent property of a classifier, no matter how I got it. And IRM actually has invariant classifier only if you apply it to logistic or squared loss, and, and we're uh, much more general than that. Uh, also, we have many other theoretical results comparing to IRM in the paper, but I won't get into that for now. Okay, so we show this correspondence in, in kind of the expectation cases, right? In the population case, but what, what can we ask about this? So let's say we have something which is calibrated on a, on a set of training environments. Does it imply calibration on the entire set of environments? environments? What can we formally claim about classifier? If it's calibrated, does it use these anti, these first uh, features or not? And what we could show is we have some answers, limited answers to these questions in a simplified sense, so in a linear Gaussian model. And what we show is settings where the environments are, are parameterized by mean vectors and covariance, covariance matrices. So that the entire set of environments is just a set of all possible kind of Gaussians. And we will look into two scenarios, which are not our full scenario, but they capture uh, most of it. Uh, one is where we have no causal features 
only anti-causal, which are spurious and non-spurious. And the other where we have causal features, but we have no non-spurious features. And what we can show is in the first case, we, if the dimension of spurious features is, is DSP, uh, we assume the following uh, the generating process. So Y is, is uh, binary. And the spurious features are Gaussian and their mean depends on the environment. So you have some mean mu i, which varies by the environments. And again, we assume in the test time we'll have like a new environment and new mu, which we've never seen. And the non spurious have the same mean. So they're, they do not depend on E and, and they replicate across environments, including the test environment. But of course, we don't know that. We get all the X together and we need to figure out which ones are spurious and which ones are not. And we assume we learn some linear classifier with some sigmoid or whatever, some invariable function. And what we show is the following. So if we have enough training environments, so two times the, the dimension of the spurious features, if we have some mild non-degeneracy conditions, any classifier that is calibrated on the set of training environments has zero weights on uh, the spurious features. So it learns to ignore the spurious features. So if you're calibrated on enough environments, you automatically learn what are the spurious features and that you should not use them. Okay, so that's one result in this linear Gaussian case. And in this case, we have causal features. So we have two dimensions, the causal dimension and the spurious dimension. And we assume the causal features have some normal distribution, which depends on the environment, right? So because we have this error, Y has some causal weight vector times XC plus some noise. And we have the spurious features, which are generated by Y and again, have some Gaussian noise. And again, we do not know a priori which features are causal and anti-causal. And we want to see if calibration helps us learn that. And again, if we have enough training environments and some mild non-degeneracy, only if you're calibrated on all uh, training environments will you have the optimal causal uh, classifier, which throws away all the spurious correlations and only uses the, cause that, the causal ones. And this is actually a nip and only. So in these cases, in these two linear Gaussian cases, we can prove that if you're calibrated across enough training environments, which are diverse, that's the non-degeneracy, they can't all be the same. You discard the spurious correlations and you achieve other distribution calibration, again, if, if you have enough. So here we show the calibration is the same as discarding the spurious, the spurious features. And it's the same as bounding the worst case risk. Actually, we have, I haven't shown it here, but, but we can show that. Okay, so this motivates calibration, at least uh, uh, in the simple setting. Uh, does this go into practice? So I'll, I'll go very shortly into this. So this, again, this is kind of in expectation and, and linear Gaussian settings, but we tried this in practice and we uh, tried three things. One is just using model selection. So you can test calibration. It's very easy to draw a calibration curve and you measure how far off is your model from the true, uh, from the optimal calibration. And we could just use this for model selection. Just so you have a bunch of models, which model is most calibrated. We could do post-processing. We could take our model and refine it using something called isotonic regression, which has been around for 20 years. Or we can actually have a, a, a a calibration objective and minimize an objective, which is let's say a sum of the ordinary objective and calibration objective and see what happens there. Uh, and what we show is all three methods actually work quite nicely. Uh, I don't have time for this, so I won't go over how we actually do this, but I'll just say one is this is a tonic regression is post-processing. You learn the model and then you just rejigger the probabilities to be more calibrated. Uh, and we do this across multiple environments. So, so, so I'll, we'll be calibrated across all of them uh, simultaneously. The other tool, the calibration objective, what is a very nice paper from Kumar et al from uh, uh, three years ago. And they have this kernel objective, which they show minimizes uh, a calibration error. And we again, take this, uh, extend this to the multiple environment setting and show that uh, this uh, objective is zero if and only if uh, the classifier is calibrated on all the training environments. Okay, so, and this, we could just differentiate, differentiate through this and minimize and you know, backprop uh, and all the normal stuff. 
And I'll just show you two results before I'm done. So this is from the WILDS benchmark uh, from the Stanford group uh, released last year and still in development. And they have, I'll show results on two settings, the satellite images and the pathology slides. And we have other tasks in the paper. And let me just take you through a few results. So FMAO is the uh, satellite images taken. So you want to predict land use. You have images from certain years and places, and the test set is from different areas in the world and different years. And we take ERM, and uh, we look at um, the, the accuracy of the original uh, algorithm. And then we start applying stuff. We start doing naive calibration. Then we do the robust calibration, which is calibrating across multiple uh, uh, domains simultaneously. And then this uh, full end-to-end -end differential objective. And we see that performance improves. Same goes for chameleon, which is pathology slides from different hospitals, where the test is from a different, yet another different hospital. And again, we see that performance it improves substantially okay, over what they published in the benchmark. And this works even if the original networks were trained with other methods. So we use Deep Corral, which is a widely used adaptation, domain adaptation framework, or IRM. And we take whatever they learn from those and then just apply either post processing for these two or fine tuning the last uh, a, a few layers using uh, that objective. And performance just jumps. This is much better performance. And we've seen this across most, not all, but most of our tasks that doing this robust calibration really improves the out of domain uh, uh, performance substantially. And another way to see this is uh, here we're, we're looking at actually the average calibration error across training environments and the out of distribution accuracy. And let's say for the blue one, we start with the original, then apply uh, ordinary calibration, then robust calibration, and we see that EC improves and performance improves. And then we apply Clove, which is the ultimate, like find, like the end-to-end -end objective and improve, it improves yet again. And the same happens if we train with IRN or with Deep Corral. And best performance is for Deep Corral, but we see this very clear correlation between getting better uh, calibration on the training environments, on the multiple training environments and getting better at OOD accuracy. And we have more examples of this, but I'll skip that. So what we see is calibration on multiple environments is a good proxy for robustness. And this is something we can actively pursue. And this observation is backed up by both theory and experiment. And even simple stuff like post-processing calibration or just plotting calibration curves and comparing calibration scores for model selection is helpful. And these are all observable. So out of distribution is difficult because you don't see your test set. You have no validation set. But these are all observable because they use your training set. And they use the fact that it's partitioned into environments in a specific way. And, and these work, even the simple stuff like post process. So, okay. Uh, just for, for the discussion, what is the formal goal of out domain generalization? So, we had two different kind of ways to formalize it. It's, there are other ways to do that. And how can, can this be translated into useful algorithms? So again, we saw two of them using HSIC and using calibration, uh, but there are many, many more. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, the people who did most of the work, uh, students and former student, former students, Daniel Greenfield, Joao Wald and Amir Feder. And thank you everyone uh, for your time and attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. Contractability of the verification. I, I'm not sure I understand what's contractability of the verification process. Um, cigar. Um, let me let me ask a quick question. First, thanks for really a fantastic talk and 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 great work. Um, but um, one thing is uh, that may not be a consideration in practice. What if you have a great uh, model, a great predictor? Right, so uh, errors are rare, a rare, rare event. 
does that make it hard to you know uh, measure you know the independence of your errors yeah uh, yeah that, that's a very good point uh yes if for example estimate estimating calibration is really hard if you're right all the time uh and yeah and i we actually this this point did come up in practice in some of our of, of in our in some of our experiments where we had just so few errors we couldn't estimate calibration error uh, very well or optimize it um and the hope is then that if if you have such a great model it will generalize but we cannot prove that right uh yeah so that's a good question and i don't think i have a very good uh, answer to it uh People in practice have tried perturbing or mining for hard negatives or doing all kinds of, like you could say, okay, I'm correct, but I was almost wrong here. So there are all kinds of, of ways to look into that, but we haven't explored how we can kind of merge them with, with our methods. Uh, okay, see a question about verification. So it's not actually, so what's nice about calibration, it's not very expensive. It's about as hard as just estimating your loss a bit, a bit more, but not much more. And so it's, it's, calibration is very easy to estimate. It's also, it's so widely used. You have the, you have kind of packages for it. You don't need to invent anything. So uh, the only uh, change we need to do is to make it for multiple environments so simultaneously, but that's not, not very hard. Um, yeah, I saw the question earlier about the calendar week. So it's, it's really hard to ignore the background. So it's hard to kind of, and it's not always obvious what you need to ignore. Some, sometimes you do not need to ignore the background uh, of the cow. And, and knowing what is the cow and what is the background is in itself a difficult uh, problem. And, and I'm sure that if you uh, learn a model for uh, uh, partitioning the cow from the background, it will not generalize well once the statistics of the background change. Uh, most models, at least, I would imagine, will not work well. So, so this is actually hard. And uh, Pietro Perona has a bunch of really nice examples of all these failures of kind of the state of the art deep learning models uh, on, on many such, like many such, like visually striking uh, examples. I have one more question, maybe from more, um... Uh, conceptual and intuitive kind of uh, perspective. Um, causality is 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 very much a, a discrete thing, right? It's an all all or nothing kind of thing. Uh, property of of your model, and but you're learning with a lot of uh, differentiable uh, models and stuff like that. So so you can't really have this property be discrete. So how sensitive are, are things to you know almost uh, independence and so on? So, yeah, that's that's a good question. So for ASIC, we kind of had, so ASIC didn't really rely on causal graph, but we did have kind of this almost, we, we had these bounds which said that if you're almost independent, then your error will be small. So that played nicely. For the calibration, we so far do not have such a result that says, okay, if you're almost calibrated, then like what kind of shifts can you accommodate? Our experiments are very encouraging. Again, like, both for ASIC and here, these things worked. Like we did not, of course we, we, we had to tune stuff and so on, but it wasn't like a crazy hard thing to make it work. We just recalibrated across multiple domains and bam, performance improved. And that gives us kind of a cause for optimism that there are these kind of, if you're almost calibrated then you're almost uh, robust or if there's a weak arrow from E to Y, then you're still okay. But there's still a gap here between the theory and the practice, uh, definitely. And by the way, I, I see, I imagine there are many students, like, it, of course, I'm not here giving a talk about all the projects that failed and did not work. Uh, <laughs> not, like we had all kinds of ideas and some of them did not just work or did not work at all. So, you know, we, there's a, some survivor bias in what I'm talking about. Hopefully you're still calibrated though. Uh, so. Uh... <laughs> Thank you again, uh, virtual applause for a really great talk. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you everyone, have a great day.